So Travis, are you at UMass or are you at McGill? I've got McGill in your short bio that got sent. Oh, no, no, I'm at UMass. I did my PhD at McGill. I'm, I'm uh, in the neurobiology department at UMass Med. Right, okay. <laughs> That's sort of you doing the introduction, but uh, yeah. So um, actually I had the pleasure of hosting Travis uh, a year ago at Vanderbilt and he's uh, doing really exciting research in the area of um, uh, viral like signaling, regulating synaptic plasticity, small RNA trafficking into extracellular vesicles. Um, he is an assistant professor at UMass and um, he uh, previously um, studied at McGill where he, where he studied stem cell formation using Drosophila. He then did a postdoc studying small RNA regulation of transposon um, regulation. Um, and then uh, he got into extracellular vesicles um, through trying to understand this relationship between uh, EVs and um, uh, endogenous retroviruses. Um, so he's been doing work on synaptic plasticity at the Drosophila neuromuscular junction. And as you can see from his title, we will, we will hear about how viral-like signaling regulates um, synaptic plasticity there. Does this look okay? Yep. Yeah, it looks great. All right, great. So thanks, Alyssa, for the wonderful introduction. And thanks for giving me this opportunity to give a web EV talk. This is a novel way for me to present things. I've never done a YouTube uh, talk, so this is this is cool. So uh, to give you the punchline first, uh, my lab is interested in this viral-like signaling at the NMJ. And let me see if I can, uh, you'll, you'll accept my mouse. So basically what we found is that this protein arc, the Drosophila homolog of this, is forming a capsid-like structure it transfers out of the presynaptic bouton, which is part of the motor neuron. It transfers across the synaptic cleft and somehow uh, regulates uh, plasticity. It's this viral-like behavior that's key to this uh, regulation of synaptic plasticity. And how I got there was actually due to my interest in uh, transposons, this large constituent of our junk, uh, of our genome, which we don't really understand that well. And uh, so where this started out was my interest in the human genome. So this is a representation of the human genome. And this little bald spot up here is a part of the human genome that we, we can attribute a function to. So here are the protein coding genes, centromeres, telomeres, a bunch of other things, long non-coding RNAs, et cetera, et cetera. The overwhelming majority of our DNA appears to have no uh, function. It used to be called junk DNA. The junk DNA got offended, so we called it dark matter DNA. But dark matter DNA is, it, it makes no sense. It's a, I guess it's uh, playing to physicists and dark matter and dark energy, but it really doesn't apply to what we're talking about with DNA. It's a bad analogy. So some people are calling it non-genic DNA, but um, I often refer to it as junk DNA, uh, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't have a function. But uh, what we found over time is that when we sequence genomes and we start lining up different genomes, we're finding the region in between genes. So these are syntenic regions, but the region in between conserved genes can have a high conservation. So here's a syntenic region. These red areas of higher conservation here are actually in between coding genes. And so there's this really weird uh, uh, conservation of junk DNA, not all of it, but some of it. And so I'm really curious why we keep around all this junk DNA. So I'm always looking for functions of, of junk DNA. About half of the junk DNA in humans, as represented in this blue area, is comprised of transposons. So transposons are, are selfish genetic elements that hop around in our genome. They were discovered by Mar Barbara McClintock in the 1940s. And basically, there's several different flavors of transposons. We're really interested in retrotransposons. So retrotransposons copy themselves into an RNA intermediate. They reverse transcribe, and then they integrate into the genome at a new site. Transposons, not only is this an esoteric function of the genome, so I'm really interested in why we keep all these uh, pieces of junk DNA, these transposons around, 
but the regulation of, of transposons is also really important for, our, uh, for genome survivability. So as you can imagine, uh, a piece of DNA jumping around and inserting into genes will disrupt that gene function and you'll, you could have a, con, uh, a disease. So retinoblastoma is due to uh, some types of retinoblastoma, hemophilia, many types of cancer can be attributed to uh, transposon inserting into a gene that it normally wouldn't be found in. Tra that's kind of the bad side of transposon. Transposons also drive evolution. So as these transposons jump around in our genome, they can change splicing, they can change expression of genes, they can make new gene products. And if they give the host an advantage, they're selected for and they become a new gene. Uh, some, a really big example of this is a VDJ recombination um, site in, in mammals, which is needed to make uh, antibodies against antigens. That is probably the remnant of a transposon. Other things like placental development in mammals is believed to be due to a transposon event. So transposons really do drive evolution. So most of my work is currently in flies. And so I, I could talk all day about how wonderful flies are, but I, I want to talk about some salient features of flies that we uh, take advantage of. So uh, flies have a smaller genome that's much easier and less expensive to sequence. It's less junky than the human genome um, with only about a quarter of the genome uh, comprising transposons. And there's a phase in uh, Drosophila development where we can actually, the chromosomes endo-replicate. So you get these huge chromosomes that you can see under low uh, magnification. And we have a high resolution physical map of the Drosophila genome. So when you're looking at repetitive sequence in the genome, we can actually map this with a higher resolution. And finally, people have been studying transposable elements in flies, uh, actually manipulating them in fruit flies for over 40 years now. So it's really a really powerful system to understand transposons. So uh, back to transposons. So here we have the HIV genome. And all that I'm trying to show here is that uh, HIV has a gag and a pollen and an envelope region. And here's Gypsy, which is a common retrotransposon in flies, has a gag and a pollen an envelope region, and there's even the protease domain, the transmembrane domain, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, it's a, a discussion over a beer, which came first, the retrotransposons or the retroviruses. Uh, uh, but regardless, some types of retrotransposons are very similar to retroviruses. And so keeping that in mind, uh, one thing that viruses do are they leave one cell to go to another. And of course, we're living through that uh, effect right now. And so this is where uh, this is where my interest in extracellular vesicles started. I reasoned that if a transposon can act like a virus, it can leave a cell and go to another. So if I identify proteins and RNAs that are in extracellular vesicles, I have a shot at identifying transposons that maybe are moving around in a host organism and perhaps maybe have a function. So as there's Plenty of great talks if you look through this WebEV talk series, uh, uh, previous and I'm sure future, which really dissect what extracellular vesicles are. Uh, right now, we have a pretty agnostic look at it. We don't know if we're looking at exosomes or microvesicles. We just use this, this uh, generic term extracellular vesicles at this point. But uh, the reason why I started a postdoc with Vivian Budnick is that she showed that there's transsynaptic uh, propagation of morphogen across the synapse, and that is due to that uh, ride actually on the outside of EVs. And so uh, being that this is a Drosophila system, I thought this was ideal for my interest in transposons and how they might be moving from one cell to another and maybe regulating uh, host functions. So we started by identifying EV cargos. Uh, so we basically isolate EVs. We identify the mRNAs and proteins, pretty standard for a lot of people in the EV field. Uh, we used Drosophila S2 cells because they grow uh, really well in serum-free media. Uh, they have a robust transient transfection. And what's key is that they're from Drosophila. And so um, <clears throat> I did warn you I would talk about how awesome Drosophila are at several points. So one of the key most powerful things that the Drosophila genetic system allows us to do is to turn on and on and off genes in almost any tissue. So here, this is developing Drosophila embryo. 
you're seeing GFP expressed in most of the cells and alternating splices of GFP and RFP. And so what's really cool here is not only are we turning on our RFP marker, in those same cells, we're turning off GFP. And so we have a plethora of tools that basically allow us to turn on any gene in any cell or turn it off at any time in development. And so that's just this tool bag that's really critical. And I'll show you some experiments that we take advantage of the system in Drosophila. So back to identifying cargos, we used to do uh, differential center fugation. Recently, we went to uh, size exclusion column sets um, from ISON. We always try and assay things by EM, and then we identify through mass uh, next generation sequencing uh, the RNAs or through protein spec, uh, the proteins that are there. So, uh, you know, when we started isolating the extracellular vesicles, we took some of it and sequenced the proteins, and the sanity check passed. We see things like tetraspanins, things that you would expect to see in extracellular vesicles. And when we looked at the RNAs, uh, this RNA really popped out. It was very abundant and very enriched in extracellular vesicles, and that's the Drosophila homolog of ARC. What is ARC? ARC is activity regulated cytoskeleton associated protein. And if you're at the NMJ like we are and looking at plasticity like we like to, it's, it's a really exciting gene to come out on a screen. So this is, it's been studied for almost 30 years in mice. And here we have an electrically shocked mouse. This is part of the mouse brain. After shock, uh, this is, um, these neurons are obviously stimulated by the shock. You get a huge plume of ARC RNA and then protein expression. So it's really responding to activity. And through a number of experiments that have come out uh, over a thousand papers on, on ARC, shows that ARC is needed for the formation of, of uh, synapses, uh, maturation, but it's really key for synaptic plasticity. And uh, synaptic plasticity is key to learning and memory and perturbation of synaptic plasticity leads to many uh, diseases or disease states or uh, dysfunctional neurons. So what is plasticity? So neurons make connections that we call synapses uh, or junctions. And when, um, when they make these connections to, to send signals along, electrochemical signals, if there's an increase in activity, they strengthen the synapses. And when there's a decrease in, in signaling, they can scale back these things. And so basically plasticity is just the ability of neurons to increase or decrease their connections with uh, downstream cells. Usually other neurons, in our case, it's a neuromuscular junction. So it's actually a connection between a synapse and a muscle. And so um, I think this is one of the last Drosophila are awesome slides. We do our work at the Drosophila larval NMJ. And here we have EGFP expressed uh, predominantly in the muscles. And what you should get, or what I hope is apparent, is basically this is a big crawling meat tube. It's a big hunk of muscle that just crawls along eating all the time. And so if you're interested in how neurons make connections or neuromuscular junctions, this is an ideal system because it goes through a very quick growth. So this is shortly after hatching out of an egg. This is about 48 hours later. You can see there's been a huge expansion in volume. But when you look at the surface area of the muscle, it's even more striking. So this is actually halfway through first instar. This is about 36 hours later. You see this over a hundred fold increase in the surface area of the muscles. And innervating these muscles are motor neurons. Here's what a motor neuron looks like. It sits in between these muscle segments and it makes synaptic junctions, neuromuscular junctions between the motor neuron and the terminal, this is a terminal, and the, the surrounding muscle, okay? This is a motor, uh, motor neuron driven process. So as the motor neuron grows, it makes these round structures, which are actually where the rubber meets the road. These are synaptic uh, boutons. So this is actually where your active zone, this is, this is where the information is going across the firing. So as the motor neuron expands, it makes more of these boutons. And as these boutons expand, it communicates back and forth with the muscle to make the postsynaptic side of a, of a synapse. And through this, uh, through this, the muscle expands in size, okay? And so uh, um, what does this look like? Well, I'll be referring to this several times. So in red, we've labeled them the presynaptic side. So this is the terminus of 
the motor neuron, and then the green labels the postsynaptic side that's in the muscle. And so together, the pre and the post side make a synapse. And uh, this is a really powerful system to study this. So back to why extracellular vesicles are really uh, germane to this subject is that, um, as you can imagine, this is an, synapses rely on electrical potential for their firing. And so you can't have an open porous system because you're going to have the ions leaking out and depolarization. But yet you have to have communication between this presynaptic bouton and the postsynaptic area. And so it's really, uh, we think that's why you have a lot of vesicular trafficking here in the terms, not just uh, synaptic vesicles, but in the terms of extracellular vesicles like exosomes are, are needed to communicate back and forth between this so that the polarity, so the highly charged membranes are kept so that these things can actually fire. So, uh, and then the final thing I just want to point out that pre that really precise genetic control that I mentioned earlier is also present at the Drosophila NMJ. So in this case, here's a wild type. Uh, this is EVI. It's a protein that sits actually in the membrane of extracellular vesicles. And we can knock down EVI specifically in the red, in the motor neuron, the presynaptic size. And what you can see when we knock down EVI presynaptically, we see a lack, uh, a decrease of EVI postsynaptically compared to the wild type. So that means we can turn off a gene on one side that's riding along on extracellular vesicle and see if that affects the transfer of that protein or other proteins. So it's really a nice system where you can turn on or off EVs in different cellular compartments and see how that affects communication. So anyway, back to ARC. Uh, we found that ARC was enriched as an RNA and we also found that it was enriched as a protein. And so what is ARC as a, so it's important for synaptic plasticity, but what is ARC as a protein? And here we have this open reading frame of ARC. It actually, uh, most of the open reading frame of ARC looks like a gypsy-like gag region. So that retrotransposon I mentioned before. So this is ARC. It looks like uh, the gag region. So here's a retroviral genome, a gag and a pollen envelope. And in the gag region of viruses, they can encode the capsid. So here's a virus, here's the envelope, here's the, this hexagonal structure is uh, what the capsid proteins comprise of. And so you have this capsid uh, protein structure surrounding the viral-like genome. And so that's what ARC looks like. And so we wanted to see if maybe ARC was behaving like a retrotransposon or retroviral uh, capsid. So first things first, do we see ARC? So that started with S2 cells. We want to see if actually ARC was at the NMJ. And um, we actually found ARC RNA and protein are at the NMJ. We made CRISPR alleles against ARC. There was existing uh, deletions that took out ARC as well. And so we were able to make nulls of ARC. And also with RNAi, we're able to reduce ARC presynaptic, presynaptically. And what we found is that there's a strong phenotype. So in a wild type and neuromuscular junction, we see, you know, 100-ish of these boutons, but in an arc null, we see about a 50% reduction, and the RNAi constructs, when expressed presynaptically, lead to a decrease in boutons. So this is consistent with arc having a role in uh, developmental plasticity at the neuromuscular junction. We can also do uh, activity paradigms. So in this case, we can take a, a larvae and we can culture it for a couple hours, at least 130 minutes, and we can add potassium, potassium, which stimulates them. So they're firing. So we're adding a, a potassium and these neurons are firing, 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 firing. And in a wild type situation, when you cause a lot of firing, this is an increase in activity, plasticity increases, so you get more boutons forming. And so we can count, we can measure this effect. So here's a wild type uh, larvae. When we stimulate it with potassium, we get a huge increase, a sevenfold increase in these bouton formation. ARC isn't capable of doing that. There's, they're, they're just not plastic at all, whether it's a null or a knockdown presynaptically. So this is really consistent with an idea that ARC is uh, regulating syn uh, plasticity, synaptic plasticity at the Drosophila NMJ. So just to summarize, we saw ARC is in uh, EVs, the mRNA and protein are present at the neuromuscular junction, and down regulation of ARC elicits NMJ, arbor and plasticity defects. So 
so that, you know, for our interest in plasticity, that's really cool. But what is that? It is it behaving like a virus. So is it transferring from one cell type to another? Does it actually act like a capsid? So what we did was we knocked down ARC only in the presynaptic um, compartment. And what we find when you reduce ARC on the presynaptic side, you lose almost all the ARC RNA and protein postsynaptically. So this uh, shows that ARC is made in the presynaptic side and transfers into the postsynaptic. So um, the so uh, what was the oh and the other thing we we did was we expressed a Rab11 dominant negative presynaptically, and we measured if there is any decrease of ARC transfer from the pre to post side, and we see that. So that's consistent with ARC being riding in or on some sort of extracellular vesicle from the presynaptic to the postsynaptic side. All right, so uh, this was perhaps a little bit naive of me, but um, when RNA is localized, so this case it's transferring from one uh, cell type to another, I reason that that's an RNA localization effect. And 90% of the RNAs out there, when they have show a localized phenotype, that's due to sequences in the three prime UTR. So here we have, uh, so we wanted to test if the ARC3 prime UTR is needed for ARC transfer. And so uh, here's uh, ARC null where we're expressing uh, ARC with its endogenous three prime UTR. And so we see ARC and we express that presynaptically, we see a transfer of ARC out of the presynaptic side into the postsynaptic side. So the three prime UTR can regulate that. When we take the ARC3 prime UTR and replace it uh, with a generic, uh, UTR, in this case SV40, you get robust expression ARC, but it's locked in the bouton. So you really do need this three prime UTR for the transfer of ARC. Interestingly, when we take a wild type construct, the one here that transfers from the pre to post side, and we express that strongly in the muscle, we do get ARC expression, but it never gets into that postsynaptic area that it does in wild type. So you really do need expression on the presynaptic side for it to transfer and get into the postsynaptic. So uh, that showed that the three prime UTR was uh, necessary for uh, transfer, is it sufficient? So we basically uh, bashed the three prime UTR of ARC uh, by adding it downstream of the GFP open reading frame. We'd express these presynaptically and check if we saw GFP post. And so um, uh, we did that with a bunch of different constructs. Here we have GFP with the generic three prime UTR. And we see we get robust expression of GFP, but it's locked in the presynaptic side. But when we add the ARC3 prime UTR, you get robust transfer. And of course, GFP is a um, highly soluble protein and it diffuses away, okay? So this shows that the ARC3 prime UTR is also sufficient for uh, transfer across the synapse. We also looked at this construct in an ARC null background and it's not as clear cut as this, but uh, we see about 90% of the GFP is stuck in the, uh, in the presynaptic side compared to uh, either the, the no transfer control or transfer control. So you really do need for efficient uh, transfer, you really need ARC 3 prime UTR and its own endogenous protein. So you need ARC protein. And so just think about this result for a second, I put a pin in it, I'm gonna come back to it in a couple of slides. So, so um, you know, the, so that's all really interesting. The ARC3 prime UTR is necessary and sufficient for transfer of ARC and, and an exogenous protein, but does this mean anything in a biological sense? So here we have wild type, here we have the uh, ARC null, so about a 50% reduction in, in these boutons. When we express a rescue construct with its endogenous three prime UTR, so this is basically a wild type rescue construct, we almost get a 100% rescue of ARC uh, phenotype. So we get almost normal number of boutons. When we express that same rescue construct in muscle, we don't get any rescue at all. And now when we express the same rescue construct, but instead of the endogenous ARC three prime UTR, we now have replaced that with SV40. So ARC can't transfer anymore and it's no rescue whatsoever. So, so not only is the three prime UTR needed for transfer, you need that transfer for whatever function ARC is playing at the NMJ. 
So our mRNA protein crosses the synapse, the three prime UTR is necessary and sufficient for that transfer. And you also need that transfer for arc function, whatever, however it's regulating plasticity via this transfer, you really need that transfer. So, so that, that's really cool. That's, or we thought that was very interesting, but uh, it doesn't really answer is arc behaving like a capsid. So this, it shows that it, that it's at least transferring like you would expect a viral encoded capsid could, but is it behaving, uh, does it have other capsid-like properties? So we made a couple of predictions. So if it forms a capsid, it should surround uh, its own transcript, just like a viral capsid surrounds its own genome. And uh, another prediction is, or a question we had was ARC protein confident to actually form a capsid? And so the first thing was first was, does ARC bind its own RNA? And yes, ARC can, in a, in a biochemical assay, we can show that ARC is binding its own transcript, but it'll bind any RNA that we put in front of it. So in the assays that we have, there is no specificity. However, when we immunoprecipitate ARC from wild type flies, and we assay for ARC RNA, we see at least in this assay that it, there does seem to be some sort of enrichment for ARC uh, protein with its own transcript. We looked at uh, ribosomal RNA, so it's not through, uh, we don't think it's through a translational intermediate or translating intermediate. We looked at other housekeeping genes and another capsid encoded protein. And so there is some specificity of ARC for its own transcript, but uh, it doesn't, we can't uh, suss that out uh, biochemically. And so uh, remember, I told you to put a pin in this experiment. So we showed GFP, the three prime UTR of ARC can uh, lead to the transfer of GFP across the synapse. We wanted to see, so we want, we drilled down a little bit further on this. So in this fly, which has GFP and the SV40, so it's a generic three prime UTR and you're not getting transfer. When we immunoprecipitate ARC, then look for the GFP transcript. We do not see that. So in this fly where you're not getting transfer of GFP across the synapse, there is no co-immunoprecipitation of ARC protein and GFP transcript. However, when we put the ARC 3' UTR downstream of the GFP ORF, now when we immunoprecipitate ARC protein, we see GFP RNA co-immunoprecipitating. So uh, this really uh, puts a period on those experiments that showed ARC was necessary and sufficient, uh, the three prime UTR is necessary and sufficient, and it's also making some sort of con uh, complex with itself. So uh, um, we wanted to see if ARC uh, assembles into a capsid, and I forgot the reference, I'll put that in a bit. But um, so basically capsid proteins uh, will polymerize and form the many subunits will form a soccer ball like round structure. So you have all these capsid proteins, uh, about 200 of them, and they form a round structure which encapsulates the genome. And so we wanted to see if uh, Drosophila arc would do that. And so uh, I have to acknowledge that Jason Shepard's lab in uh, University of Utah showed that mammalian arc also does this. It's able to form a capsid-like structure. And in a synthetic system, that, uh, that arc structure they see from mammals can transfer from one cell to, to another. But anyway, so purified uh, Drosophila arc protein is, is capable of forming a capsid-like structure by uh, negative EM stains. We also see when we take S2 cells and we take the EVs and lyse them open, we see capsid-like structures. And we can we find that some of these capsid-like structures, not all of them, but some of them are immunolabeled with ARC. So this is all consistent with a model whereby ARC forms a capsid-like structure and associates with its mRNA. So we're, we're pretty confident that this is what's happening at the Drosophila NMJ. OK, how am I doing for time? I'm doing OK. So, uh, so just to quickly go through this, this is the viral, um, this is the viral uh, synaptic transfer of RNA. We call this the visitor pathway. ARC is making capsid transferring across. And so there's a lot of questions. Question one is, what type of extracellular vesicle is this? Two, how does it dock? Three, uh, we have a bunch of questions about how this, um, uh, with the, there, the biggest question being is when ARC forms a capsid-like structure and encapsulates its own RNA, is it competent to transfer other RNAs? And then four, 
this transferred arc, how does it regulate plasticity? I'm not going to talk about any of those things today. It's something we're actively working on all those. What I will talk about are, are there other examples of this? And so we went back to RNA seq and protein seq data, and we found another RNA uh, is enriched in EVs and its protein as well is enriched and abundant. And this is actually another capsid encoded in protein, but it's not a gene like ARC. It's actually a retrotransposon. This is copia. It's one of the more abundant retrotransposons in flies, and it's a non-enveloped uh, retrotransposon. So here's Gypsy it has a gag and a pollen envelope. Copia just uh, has lost an envelope or never had any, but we know from sequencing closely related Drosophila species that copia seems to have jumped from one species to another relatively recently. So even though it doesn't have an envelope, it can get out of, uh, of cells and somehow infect another individual, um, which isn't uncommon. There's non-envelope viruses out there uh, such as um, uh, polio, and also we know from the EV field that there's uh, viruses that get out of cells through a bunch of extracellular vesicular uh, pathways, such as exosomes or microvesicles or apoptotic bodies. So the lack of an envelope doesn't really slow down a virus if it wants to get out of a cell. So this, so that's really cool. So you found extracellular vesicles have capsids. What you know, th that's not really surprising, right? Uh, but it gets weird from here on. Uh, so we need an antibody against copia, and we see that copia is a beautiful NMJ marker. So this transposon is highly enriched at the NMJ. We can knock down copia presynaptically, uh, this, this workhorse of experiment that we do. So now in this NMJ, we've knocked down copia, and we see a reduction of copia postsynaptically. So there seems to be a neuronal to muscle transfer of copia, just like a virus. And, uh, but what we notice when we look closely at the data that it's not the entire copia transcript that's present in EVs, it's spliced. And the Shiba lab in Japan over 30 years ago showed that copia could be spliced. Some tr retrotransposons do get spliced. Uh, so we wanted to see, we wanted to test the hypothesis, maybe this uh, spliced form of copia, which enrich, it basically gets rid of everything but the gag region if it has some function at the NMJ. So we made a bunch of tools so we can knock down full length copia. We made an siRNA that recognizes this uh, splice junction specifically. We made antibodies that recognize the splice to form specifically. And um, uh, we found that actually this splice form of copia is still competent to make capsids. Uh, unlike ARC where it's pretty uniform size, we find that there's at least, it's a, three distinct sizes of copia. We're trying to figure out what about the capsid is, is allowing that to happen. And we're actually figuring out the three-dimensional structure with cryo EM in collaboration with Kelch Lab here at UMass Med. Uh, we also found that when we mural precipitate copia, the short form of copia, we actually see it is still associating in vivo with its own transcript. And this copia gig is highly enriched at the bouton, just and uh, what we find is that there seems to be a predominance of copia gag in neuronal tissue. So this is copia gag in brains. And when we look at copia gag um, and we compare this short form, this copia gag form versus other tissue, we find neuronal tissues enriched for copia gag. And when we knock down copia, this short form of copia, we actually get a very striking phenotype. So we're really excited about this because this shows that a transposon has a physiological function at the NMJ. And so here we have full length copia RNAi or uh, RNA siRNA against copia gag specifically. And as opposed to ARC where we see a reduction in boutons, we see about a 50% increase in boutons. This is an unusual, but not unprecedented. Uh, phenotype. It's very exciting. And so as where ARC is needed for uh, plasticity, we did uh, a, an experiment where we added a sub-threshold. So remember that potassium experiment where when you add potassium to wild type NMJs, you get an increase in bouton formation. With copia, uh, we can add an amount of potassium to wild type situation where there's no increase in boutons but copia mutants have a huge increase in, in bouton formation. So these are hyperplastic. So ARC has a reduction of plasticity, copia mutants have an increase in plasticity. 
And so just a brief aside, you know, this is a transposon that has a physiological function. And so there's a couple of things that keep me up at night. One of them is what are all these transposons doing? Could other transposons in our genome or the fly genome have physiological function? How are they interplaying with the host, et cetera? And I'm just gonna take a couple more minutes here and just talk about uh, our current work or what we're doing with this. It obviously hasn't escaped our notice that DARK and COPE, ARC1 and COPIA have opposite phenotypes. So when you take away ARC, you have a reduction in plasticity, you take away COPIA, you have an increase in plasticity. So we wanted to see how these two are playing with each other. And so here we look at ARC in a COPIA knockdown. And what you see is an expansion of ARC expression in a COPIA knockdown, and we can, we can measure that. So you decrease ARC activity, you get, or decrease COPIA activity, you get an increase of ARC expression. Inversely, when you knock down ARC, you get a strong increase in COPIA expression. So here, there's less ARC in the system, there's more COPIA. And so uh, we're wondering genetically how these interplay, right? So uh, we know that COPIA is act repressing plasticity in an unknown method, ARC is activating plasticity in an unknown method. Do they genetically interact with each other? And so again, the beauty of flies is that we can knock down copia in an arc null phenotype background. And what we find is that the copia phenotype is dominant. And so you get this, this hyper budding, these increase in, in boutons, the, both in size and, and number of boutons. And so uh, copia sitting there as a repressor of plasticity, you know, activity, whether that's telling the neuromuscular junction to grow um, or, or an increase in, in firing through other ways, you activate ARC, then ARC acts as a repressor of copia, which then represses the repressor of plasticity. And so you get an increase in plasticity. This is a model consistent with that, but at a molecular level, we're not really sure how this occurs. My best guess is that it's at the level of extracellular vesicles. So here we have um, an ARC knockdown. And so as I showed before, you're getting more uh, copia, but what I hope this shows is here's the presynaptic side, the postsynaptic side. So we're getting more copia, but it, there's more transfer. There's a, an increase in transfer of the copia protein out of the bouton into the muscle. So I think it's occurring at the, the point of transfer, uh, but uh, I'll make that very clear. That's speculative. It's something we're looking at. And so, you know, we're doing the usual things. We're immunoprecipitating ARC and copia, and we're seeing what other RNAs are associated. We want to see if there's cargoes of ARC and copia, and if that, if them loading those cargoes is needed for some function at the NMJ. And what we found is that although ARC and copia don't seem to be in the same capsids together, they do share some of the same cargo. We see, you know, transcription factors needed for plasticity. We see a very interesting well-known coding RNA. We see members of the WINT pathway, um, other things. And so my hand wavy model, which probably I'm waving my hand so much so that it can fly, but the, the model that we have is that in a homeostatic uh, state, there's a certain, you know, there's ARC and copia are pretty uniform in or around the NMJ. You get an increase in activity, which is either, uh, uh, there's no question mark, we, we actually have data that increased activity leads to this, or in a copia knockdown, ARC becomes uh, dominant, so you have an increase in plasticity, and then in a situation where copia is predominant, ARC knockdown or decrease in activity, you get more uh, transfer of copia, and the, the things that they share get sequestered or used for plasticity or the repression of plasticity. And so I'm not yeah, I'm right on schedule. So just a brief summary here. So I hope I've shown you the power of the mighty Drosophila and how useful that is. Um, the, uh, um, I hope to have introduced you to this visitor pathway, this transfer of ARC and now Copia across the synapse and that they regulate plasticity. And introduce this concept that we're we're kind of walking around where our genomes are big bags of viruses and we're walking around with these. And and the other thing that keeps me up at night, not only what these viruses might be doing to promote us, there's an interesting like philosophical question. Are we here? Uh, are the viruses helping us? Are we helping the viruses? Are, 
So are they regulating the plasticity for their own ends or are they being a good parasite that's becoming domesticated? So it, you know, I think about this. Anyway, so uh, the overwhelming majority of the Copia work uh, was done by Adrian Lemieux, brilliant tech in the lab in the last couple of years. Peter's also uh, helping with the Copia project. He's also looking at other transposons. Aaron's another tech in the lab doing just spectacular work. Uh, the bioinformatics, uh, which I didn't really get a chance to talk to, most of done by Alfred with the help of Jimena in the lab. And Shuhao's working on that really interesting long non-coding RNA. Song's looking for other cargos of these, the visitor pathway. Io's looking at the regulation of transposons at the NMJ. Max is, you know, he works on mice. Uh, he, I can't convert him to a fly person, but Max is looking at EVs and, and uh, circuit mapping in mice. And uh, a lot of the work for ARC was done by James Ashley, Ben Cody, Deandra, uh, Franz, who was in the lab, helped me with my initial isolation of EVs. And we have uh, other support in the lab. And uh, the predominant funding source in my lab is the NIH, NINDS. All right, thank you for your time. And I'm going to stop sharing. I see there's some questions here that I can't read yet. So. Yeah, thanks, Travis. That was fascinating, as always. Um, there's one question in the chat box, but I want to ask you a quick question of my own first. So, um, you know, you, you've talked about the ARC capsids and the Copia capsids and EVs. And I'm wondering to what extent you know whether the ARC and Copia entities are EVs or are they, like, do they, if you pulled down those capsids, do they also contain EV cargos that you might expect, like EV markers? Um, or are they sort of coming out in your purifications because they sediment at the same size as EVs do? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I was actually um, whining uh, to Carolina before the talk. Uh, so I proposed this in a grant that we should really uh, identify this, right? So so what kind of vessel, if they're in vesicles, what kind of vesicles? And so I don't have a good answer for you on that. Um, the approach, one of the approaches is, so we are doing a bunch of biochemical assays, right? So we're isolating ARC and Copia and, it does look like there's other uh, tetraspanin like molecules in there. So that's pretty consistent with that. Um, there's some unconfirmed data from mammals that they're prob this is probably through the exosomal pathway, but uh, how we're another way we're trying to approach that is EM. So we're slicing a lot of larval NMJs open, seeing if we see our cocopia at the multivesicular bodies. Uh, we have uh, some tantalizing, and it's very preliminary data, but uh, it does look like ARC, uh, Copia, especially the antibody for Copia is better, does seem to be labeling um, a vesicular-like structure in and around the NMJ, but we haven't, we're, our N isn't high enough to make a, a confirmation of that. Um, but I don't know, like it, it's anybody's bet, right? Because it could be coming out as a, as a more like a, a microvesicle, it's, it's blooming off the the plasma membrane and more like a virus. I, yeah, we, we, we haven't identified that yet, um, but it's something we obviously want to work on, so. Cool. And Phil Askinas had a question. Are there uh, mammalian homologs? So ARC, yes. So ARC seems to have come out twice in the, in evolution. So once in deuterians, like the fruit flies, and then once in uh, tetrapods, uh, interestingly, it doesn't look like there's an ARC homolog in fish. So it's, it's um, and the event that led to ARC in flies is really recent, very, very recent. Um, in fact, we think ARC in flies can, um, uh, the ARC homolog in flies is, it, it could have been like in the last few hundred years, that, that reason. Um, as far as copia, uh, don't know. That's certainly something we're trying to find if there is a transposon that's behaving in a similar fashion to copia in mammalian cells. Uh, there's lots of, well, there's some endogenous retroviruses in mammals that lack an envelope. Uh, 
Uh, so they kind of look like copia, but we uh, functionally we haven't able to been we haven't tested that. So. Cool, Carolina, you had a question. Yeah, I probably have a naive question as someone who's not really uh, looking into flies, but I was just wondering whether you know what, how similar is the escort components between the flies and the, uh, the mammalian system? Do they have a similar, like, uh, well, equivalent to early endosomes, you know? Yes, um, yeah, yeah. Flies things. have a very conserved um, EV pathway or endosomal mm. pathway. Uh, so, we, we know that the EVs that contain ARC are definitely membrane bound. So they're definitely membrane bound. But, uh, but again, that kind of goes to Alyssa's question. We haven't really worked out is that butting off a multivesicular body or is it a plasma membrane event? So we haven't been able to show that yet. Mm. So, uh, but we, I mean, we do have the RAB11 dominant and negative experiment, but that's RAB11 is needed wherever you pinch a membrane. So that doesn't really, uh, but yeah, that, mm. that's the, as far as I can push it right now, so. Yeah, and um, the sec my second question is like, why, why does it need envelope as well as the EV membrane? Um, I mean, why do they need both? Well, <laughs> I, I mean, it, in a way, ARC and certainly Copia, uh, um, uh, ARC and Copia are, um, uh, what was I going to say? The, like, because they don't have an envelope, right? Mm -hmm. They probably have to rely on some sort of host membrane, right? To get out of, and then presumably to dock with a, a downstream cell. So, um, that, that's why there's probably membranes there. Like, I don't think it caps it itself unless it's a lytic event and it just breaks open the cells. It would be hard for, for a capsid to, to really transfer, so. Hmm. Um, it's Phil Askenaz again. I remember an aspect of this work, maybe from Vivian, was that the muscle would send vesicles back to the nerve to say, send more, send less. Yes. Am, am, I, am I dreaming about that? No, 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 no. So that that's uh, there's a huge amount of work done on the so uh, yeah. So it's it's um, there's the pre people which I'm one of them and and you know being trained by Viv, and then there's the post people that talk about an endocytic event. So they're saying a vesicle comes from the post side to the pre, and that's needed. So if I were to you know the the pre to post seems to be wint the post to pre seems to be CGF beta, if I'm not mistaken. And so there, there definitely does seem to be vesicles going uh, forward and backwards. So one thing I didn't talk about copia is copia is very different. And we were working on this intensively. Copia has a phenotype, whether it can transfer pre to post or post to pre. So it's, it's, it's different on that uh, effect because ARC only has a phenotype uh, pre to post. So yes, there is definitely transfer both ways. For me, the analogy is the dendritic cell and the T cell receptor. They send vesicles back and forth. Yes. At that, at that immune synapse. Yes. So, and, and so we, like that initial, like the presynaptic side sends out a bouton, right? And then it matures with the postsynaptic side. There's, there has to be a lot of communication back and forth to set that up. So it's not the, the bouton extends maybe through arc is sending a signal. There's probably, this is a much slower process. So there's probably transcriptional changes in the muscle nuclei. You know, genes are expressed, proteins packaged, and then to mature uh, the, the, the postsynaptic side and make that actual synapse. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of communication. We break it down because uh, it's already complex enough for us, so. so. <laughs> Uh, Frederick, uh, thanks for a compliment. Uh, does your three prime UTR GFP experiment suggest postsynaptic translation? Yeah, funny you should ask that. Yes, we, we were, we are very curious about that. We think that ARC is transferred as a protein or RNA encapsulated in a protein, it transfers. And we think that ARC is translated postsynaptically, but we haven't 
Um, we have uh, circumstantial evidence for that. We haven't been able to genetically tease that to see if, if that post-transferred arc translation has any function. And we're definitely, that, that's something we're really keen to find out. In synthetic uh, cell culture systems, we can definitely see that. And I think Jason Shepard's lab sh showed that with mammals, that the transferred arc RNA is translated in the post uh, cell, in the, the post transfer. It go, comes out of one cell, goes into another cell and gets translated. Mm -hmm. But whether that has any biological relevance, we nobody's tested that. Yeah, you know, his question about why is the signal spotty is an interesting one too, because I, I keep thinking about the spots as being EVs, but that that had to be translated, right? True, I, I think so. One thing when we overexpress arc, w those spots get way bigger. Um, so th that could be more trans, but the other thing that's kind of cool is when you overwhelm the, the system with too much arc, it's um, you don't get proportionally as much transfer. So you still get transfer of arc, say GFP overexpress it, but then the bouton just seems to fill with these like huge aggregates of, of arc, which I've always assumed is huge like rafts of, of you know of capsid proteins uh but yeah i think yeah so again owing to the beauty of drosophila genetics we're we're making a transcript that will be encapsulated by arc and then it can only be translated postsynaptically to really test if if that's happening but it, it's really complex genetics and 20 or 30 i'm not exaggerating i think there's a couple dozen transgenes that we have to kind of get going to get that to work. But we're, yeah, we're really curious if it's post, if it's translated post transfer, I mean, that that's be, just because of the translational control being needed for plasticity is already such an interesting field. It, yeah, we'd like to test that. So. Cool. All right, I think we're approaching the end. I know you had an announcement to make Carolina. So thank you very much, Travis. That was wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much, Travis and Alisa. Thank you so much for leading the QA and hosting Travis as well.